The lesson this morning is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 4 to 12. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labour. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three stand, strands is not quickly broken. Here ends the lesson. Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back, and it is my pleasure to be bringing you this really interesting chapter from the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, I might just quickly pray for myself and pray for all of you as you listen to me before I get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift that is your word. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for the time we have now to gather around and uh, explore that word and get in deeper to it, God, and just help me to speak clearly, speak through me, God, and please help the hearts and minds of everyone here to be open uh, to your word and what you have to say through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, playing and watching sport provides lots of opportunities to view and interact with success. Teams rise up to dominate a competition, and any success of this kind will elicit certain responses from those around them. Sometimes, an elite team's opponents will simply decide to roll over and die. They'll just kind of give up. They'll decide that it's unfair and hopeless and won't even try and compete. Others will see the success of a good team and hate and despise them for it. And still others will respond to a strong opponent by improving themselves through hard work. Responses like this happen all across sport at basically every level. But from today's passage, we can actually observe that these are that there are various responses in the pursuit of success in many more aspects of life. Today's passage opens with an observation on the nature of achievement and success. I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. It's quite a profound statement, and it's one that reveals a lot about human nature. That is, that under the sun, so much of people's pursuits and dreams are born out of seeing what others have and wanting it. This can come in many forms, such as coveting someone's wealth, status, or achievements. And I'm sure we can all agree that people still long for these things today. Following this observation, we see some of the varying responses to these things. The writer observes that fools fold their hands. Now, understanding this one is done through, best done through a bit of demonstration. Now, see, if I see what someone else is achieving and observe them while standing like this, I'm clearly acting in a particular way. I'm judging them with contempt, but more importantly, How much can someone work when their arms are folded like this? A person responding like this shows contempt for their neighbour, but also fails to respond through action in any way. They are merely standing there doing nothing. This is a response of laziness and inactivity. Proverbs warns against such idleness, saying, the craving of a sluggard will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. And Ecclesiastes certainly agrees, confirming 
that this kind of response only brings about a person's own ruin. Following this, though, we see a very different kind of person. While on one side we have the lazy person, on the other side we have a response of the totally opposite kind. That is the actions of the one who is overworking. This is someone who strives for not only one handful of rewards, but wholly commits to trying to achieve two. This person is the workaholic, and their envy has given them tunnel vision. These people are expanding all of their effort, time, and energy to acquiring the wealth that they see others enjoying. This actually leads them into greater turmoil than if they had lived more humbly, but with greater peace. And this turmoil is not going to satisfy their desires. Instead, they will continue to seek things that they can never obtain. And ultimately, the passage is saying that this too is futile, a chasing after the wind. The reason I said this is profound before is because despite this book being thousands of years old, the same problems are seen throughout our world today. We see people who bitterly despise those who have more than them, while doing nothing to improve their own situation. But we also see work people who become absent parents, distant friends, or live in constant turmoil. Ecclesiastes 1 says, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And these verses certainly show that to be true. However, this reality, though, reasserts that these observations in this book aren't just simply nihilistic in nature. Rather, they are realistic observations about the state of a world that has strayed from God. And as we come to verse 8, we can see the ultimate culmination of the meaningless of the actions taken in this fallen world. The passage says, There was a man all alone, He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. This is a bleak scene. A man who has no family and no friends is simply working away. He's working towards a goal of finding contentment in his wealth, but no matter what he achieves, it's never enough for him. As the man grinds through this daily life of work, he reflects, For whom am I toiling, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? And for him, there is no answer, because he is alone. This is summed up well at the end of the verse. This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. The tragedy here is that, once again, we see this situation played out so often in the modern world. Whether it's because a person is actually physically isolated from others or they simply focus so much on work that they neglect those around them, it's an issue that is very real and relevant to us today. This endless cycle of meaningless life under the sun is inseparable from a world that revolves around empty work, envy and selfishness. There is, however, some hope. As the next observation in this chapter is not something that is seen to be meaningless. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. In contrast to the meaninglessness of life of the one who works in vain for themselves, there is a brighter alternative. Because when we look beyond ourselves, something meaningful can happen. While one may fall and fail, two can help each other up. While one will freeze in the cold night, two can create warmth. While one may be weak and exposed, two can keep the defences strong. Unlike many of the previous statements, the writer has clearly observed some value to these things. But this goes far beyond sharing is caring or any other cliché. These observations compel the idea that God has designed us to value human relationship. God has made us in such a way that we yearn for connection, 
And we are most content when we use our labors, strivings, and toils in the service of others. In this fallen world under the sun, we are actually blessed to enjoy these things. However, this is not just a human-centric message. While it does show us the importance of human connection, a purely human approach still fails to break out of the meaningless cycle of life under the sun. Therefore, I want us to pay special attention to the final line of verse 12. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now, why did the writer change that up? He'd been talking about two the whole time, but when he gets to the end, he talks about three. You can make a cord, a strong cord out of two pieces of line. But when we look within the context of the book of Ecclesiastes, we can learn about a lot about what this sentence means in finding and pursuing success. That is, when we look under the sun, we see the world without God. And this book is observing the meaninglessness of that world. But Ecclesiastes is not saying that there is no such thing as meaning. Rather, that meaning is only found in a life with God in it. That is where we find the reason for a chord of three. It's not simply more people, but rather when people serve each other while keeping God at the centre of their lives. So what can we take from Ecclesiastes 4? Well, it's not a word against ambition, and it is not a teaching against simple living either. Rather, it's a message to be vigilant in how we approach seeking success. We mustn't be like the fool who holds, folds his hands. Laziness like this only brings around self-ruin. But as we work, we must remain on guard against the temptation to be workaholics who end up like that man who toils alone with no hope and no meaning. Instead, we should seek to be the one who seeks success by living with one full hand and in tranquility. This is displayed in a heart of service and contentedness. To have meaning, we must apply ourselves to our work in a way that actually provides for others to the glory of God who gives us every good thing. We won't always get it right. We can fall into the cycle of meaninglessness if we do not remain vigilant, but that's why we must hold firm to God. Christ Jesus came so that through his death and resurrection, we could become free of this cycle. He came so that we could be invited into a life that allows us to serve God and each other. And when he returns, we will be in a new creation, one that is no longer bound by the curse of sin resulting in selfish toil. But instead, we are invited to live in an eternal life of faithful service, working side by side with each other in the presence of God himself. So until then, let's seek to live with contentedness, work with hearts for our neighbours, and seek first the kingdom of God in all that we do. Amen.